Good afternoon, everybody. It is my honor to welcome you to the fifth panel of the Philippine Linguistic Congress, Philippine Lexicography Through the Ages. So let me share my screen. Philippine Lexicography Through the Ages, but before uh, compared to other panels, we'll be having three talks today by Ms. Honela Tumoran, uh, Divine Angela Indriga, Vinci Santiago, Noah Cruz, James Dominic Manrique, and myself at the end of the panel. But before we start, may I ask, what is, what do you think, what word do you think when you see the word lexicography? So please go to Mentimeter, menti.com, and use the code 12053790. It's our it's a different way of presenting so that we'll be able to connect and interact with the audience. So please do come in. I believe that yes, please. To answer the survey in menti.com, it's in the chat. There we go. So some people would say that the words come to mind would be dictionary and words, patterns, that's great. Etymology, ooh, deep. <laughs> so I'll give you 30 seconds so that we can collate with everyone. Please do join in. Definitions, it's amazing. Languages, records, definitely records. That's one of the things that we'll talk about today. Meaning. Oh. So let's wait for 30 more seconds. Please do join in. Dictionaries, Lima. Yes, word meanings. Dictionary seems to be the main word that we're seeing here, corpora. We do need the corpora of Philippine languages at this point. Phraseology, I can't, corpus, <laughs> phrases, <laughs> that, that variance of the words. And there we go, dictionary, lexicography, as we all know, is the study of creating dictionaries. And we'll learn more about that today. So as I said earlier, um, I will also want to introduce my co-moderator, Divine. I uh, will be st starting with Trends in Lexicography Against Linguistics Milieu of the 1950s to the present. So it's my honor to introduce Ms. Hanelet E. Dumaran, who is a graduate student of the UP Department of Linguistics. Under the PhD program, she has done grammar work on Mindanao languages, and her current research is on Bilic languages. So she actually has a master's degree in English language studies and is a member of the Department of English, MSU Iligan Institute of Technology in, Bina in Mindanao. So it's my honor to welcome Ms. Hanelet Dumaran. Uh, let's wait for a moment for her video. Lexicography is the field dedicated to the study and production of such works as vocabularies and dictionaries. Some of the decisions that need to be made in dictionary preparation pertain to macro structure. What language or languages shall be involved? Will the work define words in Tagalog and use Tagalog in defining them? 
or will it define Tagalog words using English definitions? Will it also have a section for vice versa, where English words are defined using Tagalog? How shall the collection of lemma proceed? Shall we use a corpus? Some decisions pertain to detail. How will the individual lemma be arranged? Shall related senses be defined within the entry or separately as individual lemmata? Shall we define pag-ibig under ibig or shall we give it its own entry? Do we exemplify? And what about non-content words like affixes? Do we use grammatical jargon to define them? Shall we use drawings? How do these decisions compare over time? This paper attempts to trace the development of Philippine lexicography from the 1950s to the present. This is done primarily through comparing lexicographic trends. The 1950s to the late 70s, for example, can be seen to be characterized by lexicographic works that are unidirectional, whereas the 80s to the present see a spike in bidirectional lexicographic works. These unidirectional works of the earlier years often involve English as the object language and the Philippine language as the meta language, a trend that is seen to have reversed after the 80s. This paper explores how trends such as these arise in response to developments in the linguistic landscape of the country, created by national policies, the establishment of various linguistic organizations, and the scholarship on the Philippine languages. These trends pertain to the variety of Philippine languages for which dictionaries have been written, including trends in the choice of object language and meta-language. The scope of the purpose for the creation of the dictionaries, as well as further motivations for other types of lexicographic works, and general lexicographic design features adapted across the six decades. In doing this, six timestamps in the linguistic milieu of the country in the 1950s to the present are identified. The constitutional appointment of the Institute of National Language in 1946 to lead the intellectualization of the national language the institution of SIL Philippines in 1953 as a partner of the Department of Education, the formation of professional linguistic societies in the country in the early 70s, and their leadership in linguistic scholarship in the Philippines, the implementation of the Philippine Bilingual Education Policy in 1974, the establishment of the Commission sa Wikang Filipino in 1991 and its mandate to further the use of Filipino as a national language in most domains, and the shift towards the use of the mother tongue and the scholarship of the regional languages in the 2000s. For the purposes of this paper, inferences are made from the data available in Newell and Hendrickson's Bibliography of Philippine Language Dictionaries and Vocabularies, as well as from an inventory of at least 60 lexicographic works within the six-decade period that comprises this paper's scope. The earliest National Language Planning Act made official by the Philippine Constitution is the 1937 proclamation identifying Tagalog as the basis for what will be the national language. Made into law at the close of the year, this proclamation would take effect two years later with the 1940 mandate for the teaching of the national language in all public and private learning institutions in the Philippines. By this time, the Institute of the National Language had been established as the first government agency to oversee the development of a Philippine national language. Cecilio Lopez, during this time, directed the compilation of the preliminary studies on the lexicography of some Philippine languages. The task of identifying a national language continued until the 1940s and culminated in June 4, 1946, with a proclamation of Wikang Pambansang Filipino as the official name of the national language. The INL was mandated to lead in the intellectualization of the national language. These intellectualization efforts primarily included lexicography projects. Vestiges of this can still be seen in the 1950s with a group of dictionaries that bear the name national language. These are unidirectional lexicographic works whose object language look predominantly Tagalog and whose meta-language is English. This group is separate from dictionaries that actually bear the name Tagalog in the title and Filipino. This means that the national language is a separate linguistic entity. This cumbersome name of the national language should be officially addressed in 1959 with the Department of Education Secretary Jose B. Romero issuing a department order. The national language shall be called Filipino in order to avoid the longer-labeled Filipino national language 
or national language based on Tagalog. Around this time, the Summer Institute of Linguistics has been doing language documentation in the Philippines for languages other than Tagalog, Filipino, and Cebuano. In fact, the late 50s is the beginning of the rise in the number of lexicographic works on non-major Philippine languages. And because the SIL conducts language documentation from an ethnological tradition, this period is also the beginning of a pertinent lexicographic trend in lemma arrangement, which is onomatological, a classification based on meaning groups. In the late 60s and early 70s, two professional organizations of linguists and language scholars were founded, the Linguistic Society of the Philippines and the Philippine Linguistic Circle. The LSP put out the Philippine Journal of Linguistics and the Circle put out the Archive, whose pages were dedicated to descriptive grammatical work and which published some academic papers exploring lexicographic themes. The LSP created a consortium between PNC, Ateneo, and DLSU, offering a PhD program in linguistics in 1971, and later on, a PhD program in bilingual education. The LSP sat as an active contributor in the Constitutional Commission of 1986, which revised the bilingual education policy of 1974. Lexicographic works in this period moved from a unidirectional tradition to a bidirectional one. Learners' dictionaries abounded, and commercially published vocabularies as well as pocket dictionaries increased in number. By this time, the official national language is still Filipino, and dictionaries in a regional language and Filipino or vice versa competed in number with those that used English as either metalanguage or object language. It won't be until 1987 that Filipino would become the official name of the national language. By the late 80s, there would be five dictionaries on Filipino published commercially, including the Diccionario ng Wikang Filipino, the first monolingual Filipino dictionary published by the INL, now renamed the Linangan ng Mga Wika sa Pilipinas. This dictionary is a large volume of 31,000 plus entries. With the renaming of the national language to Filipino is the establishment of the Commission sa Wikang Filipino in 1991. It is mandated to further the use of Filipino as a national language in most domains. However, it seems that the bilingual education policy of 1974 and later of 1987, as well as the availability of linguistic journals in the country, encouraged the scholarship of other Philippine languages from this period to the present. In his survey of the state of the art of Philippine linguistics in 1981, Reed concludes by identifying directions towards which areas in Philippine linguistics need to develop. About Philippine lexicography, and in addition to the development of a monolingual Filipino dictionary, which was still to be written eight years after Reed's survey, he says, a concurrent task should be the preparation of bilingual dictionaries, not simply word lists, of selected languages such as Ilocano and Cebuano with definitions in Filipino rather than in English. This would serve to strengthen the development of Filipino on the one hand and foster renewed interest in the regional languages by native speakers of Tagalog on the other. By the beginning of the 1970s, this trend of publishing more vocabularies, word lists, lexicons, thesauruses, and the like, as opposed to dictionaries, begin to reverse significantly. Data shows that by the end of the 1980s, the ratio between dictionaries and other types of lexicographic works increased to 16 is to 1, a far positive development from the 1 is to 2 ratio of the 50s. The 1970s also sees a pertinent increase in technical lexicographic work, which is not found in the 1950s and which number only one in the 1960s, with Ernesto Constantino's Ilocano Grammar and Vocabulary. This type of work is classified here as a lexicographic endeavor, but whose larger purpose is highly linguistic in nature and is intended for a specialized audience. Synchronous with this increase in number is the establishment of the LSP and the Philippine Linguistic Circle, which are professional groups of linguists and language scholars in the country. 
Included in this inventory is Zork's 1983 Core Etymological Dictionary of Filipino, a joint project sponsored by the INL, the LSP, and by the PNC Ateneo DLSU Consortium. Of prime interest to linguists, this specialized lexicographic work inventories the known reconstructions of the Filipino lemma. In this example, the letters CLPSTZ each corresponds to a reference work of another linguist that Zork references in his dictionary. This extensive work is published in several fascicles and is the first known attempt to trace the origin of words in a given Philippine language. The lexicographic works inventoried here vary from slim volumes of 50 pages to hefty volumes of more than a thousand pages. In the 1950s, the average number of pages for lexicographic works is 173 pages. This is because most of the works during this time are vocabularies and word lists. In the 1990s, this average almost triples to 486 pages. The largest volume in this inventory is Vito C. Santos' Filipino English Dictionary, first printed in 1983. It is a large volume of 2,700 plus pages. The historian Chodoro Agoncillo, in his foreword to the dictionary, calls it a towering contribution to Philippine lexicography. It contains 68,000 entries and does not employ any run on citation form. This dictionary is the first to syllabify the lemma. Bikasan's Filipino English Dictionary more than doubles the INL's dictionary entries and contains grammar notes. The front matter usually contains a user manual, listing all the abbreviations employed in the dictionary. Sometimes, this is all that the front matter contains, aside from the table of contents and the foreword or preface or introduction. The front matter also contains the grammar notes. In the 50s, only one out of 10 lexicographic works inventoried contains grammar notes. In the 1960s dictionaries inventoried, 10 out of 15 contain grammar notes. The grammar notes is the section of the lexicographic work that contains a description of the features of the language for which the dictionary is written. It usually contains an enumeration of the most productive affixes for the derivation of words and paradigmatic morphology for verbal inflection or marking. This is not an easy task to summarize for Philippine languages, and the choices made in the grammar notes in terms of what to include and how to present the information represent the analytical tradition for grammar relevant during the period. In the 1960s, for example, the INL's English Tagalog Dictionary analyzed Tagalog verbs according to conjugations. In the Pali series of the 1970s, verbal morphology is organized according to focus. In the later years, this would be described in terms of voice. Vocabularies and other non-dictionary lexicographic works, on the other hand, employ a different convention. Instead of grammar notes, these slim volumes carry a listing of paradigmatic information for certain units, such as pronouns, articles, and proper name markers. Numerals and fractions are usually presented together and separately, usually in the back matter. This is true for most SIL published vocabularies of the early years and for multilingual lexicographic works as well. Most of these vocabularies arrange their lemmata onomatologically or according to general areas of meaning. The physical world, which lists words relating to topography, including flora and fauna, Parts of the body, personal adornment and care, spatial and temporal relations, which also lists adverbs and dictics, and sense perception. But first, what do we expect from a dictionary entry? A dictionary entry contains a headword or a lemma and a definition. When the definition contains other related lemma forms that are also being defined within the entry, the definition is said to be a run-on definition. The entry may include a POS classification, which may also identify the lexical subcategorization of the lemma. Additionally, the entry may contain sample usage, such as sentences or phrases for content words, and word formation used when we are defining grammatical lemmata, such as affixes. 
full definitions are not a given. There are dictionaries that give only equivalents. In fact, all multilingual dictionaries in this survey do not use full definitions. Where full definitions are not employed, synonyms or phrasal glosses are given. However, for those that do, the full definition may consist of at least two parts, an explanation about the headword and a context in which it may occur. Vika Sans Dictionary illustrates the lexicographic design of a dictionary that employs no run-on entries. This requires that different senses are encoded as separate lemma. It is unsurprising to know that monolingual dictionaries occupy a far last in terms of number. In his 1981 survey of Philippine lexicography, Reed points out the lack of monolingual dictionaries, especially one on the national language. He underscores. The development of good monolingual dictionaries is imperative to national language development. It is a milestone in national language development and must be nurtured and developed. A successful monolingual dictionary will symbolize that the national language has come of age and is being sustained by a sizable core of Filipino scholars as well as a sizable national community literate in the national language. The lexicographic works surveyed here for the 2000s are all on regional languages. Most are published by SIL Philippines and by LSP. All contain grammar notes. Against the developments in the linguistic milieu identified earlier, the paper maps the lexicographic trends from the 1950s to the present. The period from 1937 to up to the identification of the national language in 1946 is characterized by INL-led efforts of collecting preliminary lexicographic studies. After this period, until the renaming of the national language from Filipino to Filipino, lexicographic works with Filipino as the meta-language lead in number. With the establishment of the SIL in 1953 comes a new tradition of producing multilingual dictionaries with an onomatological lemma arrangement. SIL-led efforts in language documentation gave rise to an interest in regional languages reflected in the number of dictionaries published on these languages. LSP and PLC's establishments are synonymous with a rise in the incorporation of grammar notes in the lexicographic volumes. This continues until the present. The production of monolingual dictionaries began to rise in the late 1980s, as well as of bidirectional dictionaries. At present, the continued efforts in the production of dictionaries for regional languages, as well as the writing of their grammars, remain to be the major lexicographic trend. The trends identified in this paper and their relationship with the linguistic milieu is in consonance with what Newell identifies as three major factors that account for the state of Philippine lexicography as of 1991. A desire by foreign missionaries to convey the Christian gospel to the ethnic groups of the Philippines, a marked surge of nationalism beginning in the late 19th century, producing dictionaries especially in Tagalog and Filipino, and an academic interest by foreign and local scholars in diverse Philippine languages. We can add to this list two other factors to include those that have arisen in the 90s to the present. The legislation of wide scope language planning involving regional languages for the implementation of mother tongue based instruction and the engagement of ethno-linguistic communities in the documentation of their own languages resulting in community led lexicography projects. There is an important shift involving the last two. These two shift the agency of lexicographic work from lexicographers to end users, affording the field invaluable input from the ground to an extent that has never been seen before. Because of this community involvement, the motivations are different now too, shifting away from production goals and towards heritage protection. The lexicographer now has become a curator and the end users have become partners. The lexicographic process does not conclude with the production of a dictionary. Rather, it begins where it ends, when the dictionary is handed back to the community, and with it, everything that is empowered by language.
Thank you for that very informative and wonderful talk, Honilet. And now to, to collate to the discussion and to contribute to the discussion, can you please go into Mentimeter again and answer this question? Have you seen or used a dictionary of your language? A lot of people did say yes. Please do go online and answer this question. I've, I've seen a lot of dictionaries in my language, but there's the contention between whether to use Tagalog or Filipino. It'll be great if there are other comments on whether you've seen one in your native language. Thank you for answering. And if you've seen a dictionary of your language, can you please, if you answered yes, can you please type the name of your language? That'll be the next one. Batangas, that would be great. Cebuano, Aklanon, Lucano, Tagalog, those are our answers. Iligay non, perhaps. Sorry, go non. Sambuaga Chavacano. Please do comment for the authors of this if you still have them. The women's health, Tagalog. Yeah. I'll be collating for 30 more seconds. Bicol, Pangasinense. And these uh, dictionaries do follow different lima and dictionary structure as discussed by Ms. Hanilat earlier. Central Bicol, Bicol. So that's the unique. <laughs> and Cebuano Bisaya. Thank you very much for those who contributed to the Mentimeter. And now... Uh, we'll, I will please to write your questions for Ms. Honolet. We'll have a, an open forum at the end of every pres uh, at the end of all presentations. And for now, it is my honor to introduce the next speakers. So there we have four speakers today for Lexicovid two language of pandemic. I'll introduce first Ms. Divine Angeli P. Entriga, who is the assistant professor of UP. Department of Linguistics, and she's now taking her doctorate in linguistics in the same institution. Uh, the next, another speaker for Lexicovid is Vinci Santiago, who is also an instructor and a graduate student of UP Department of Linguistics. Noah Cruz is also a faculty member of the Department of Linguistics, and he's currently pursuing his master's too, as well. James Dominic Manrique just finished his BA linguistics degree and his research interests, the same with most, are language variation, computer mediated communication, and language education. And lastly, Jureka Chin Brigo, even though she's not a speaker, is part of the technical team of the Lexicovid project and is currently a research associate of the Department of Linguistics in UP Diliman. And that's our speakers for today. Before I continue, before I pass the floor to them, we'll go back to Mentimeter. And let's ask, the, let's have some short exercise. <laughs> Please do write your first name and your last name. Please do join us in this short quiz. Oh, I'll be <laughs> eight, nine people, people who wants to add. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's loading for a bit. Please do join us at menticop.com and just input 12053790. I'll be adding maybe 30 more seconds. Contenders. <laughs> We do have a lot of people joining in. <laughs> That'll be great. And let's start. 
do answer fast to get more points. <laughs> and what is the word most associated with the pandemic? Is it vaccine, lockdown, COVID? What do you think? It's actually vaccine. So who took the top spot? Whoever Croc is, congratulations. <laughs> Next question. Do you answer fast? What do you think is the emotion that was felt by most people in relation to the pandemic? Is it hope, anxiety, or frustration? That's right. A lot of people felt anxious during the pandemic. Let's see who's stopping the board. We have a new number one. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> Next question. What does suob mean? Does anybody know? Is it a mask, steam inhalation, or does it mean lockdown? It's steam inhalation. That's what suob means. Crocodile is still leading the pack. <laughs> and our last question for this discussion. To answer fast to get more points. What does choir and look mean? Visiting relatives in quarantine, work-related emails, or the new normal fashion? And time's up. Of course, it's the new normal fashion. So we have still the crocodile as, oh, Rhea, a giveaway, who's her new top contender. So later we'll continue on with the quiz. And I'll pass the screen. <laughs> to our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mantha, for facilitating that wonderful exercise. And uh, it's, it's the best that we can approximate in this remote setup. Na sana isama-sama tayo ngayon bilang um, mga attendees ng conference na to. So uh, let me just start our presentation on hashtag LexiCovid2, language of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So uh, next, please. So this, um, just to introduce what we're going to uh, talk about this afternoon, this is something that uh, we want to see the change and continuity from the first project phase of the LexiCovid, um, of hashtag LexiCovid. We launched this project last year in August in commemoration of the 98th year of the UP Department of Linguistics. And in general, it aimed to track and record the language associated with the pandemic, how we make sense of the circumstances we find ourselves in, and how we describe our collective experience. So uh, this is not on the slide, but I would just like to add that uh, I know that we will, um, we will be showing some quite humorous examples and there are going to be some funny words and inclusions in the data, that's true. But I would just like to say that uh, the LexiCovid team uh, does not downplay and does not uh, intend to um, trivialize this uh, very, um, as we always say, unprecedented experience and uh, quite um, 
troublesome. Troublesome is a is a is a even a light word to choose for this um, uh, experience for all of us. Next slide, please. So for the second phase, we what we did was we uh, tried to uncover the possible changes and continuities in how the languages we use make sense of and at the same time are shaped by the ongoing pandemic, especially now in light of the emergence of the more contagious Delta and Lambda variants of the virus. Next, please. So I'd like to show you the LexiCovid survey. We um, issued the second call for respondents in July 13 this year through the UP Department of Linguistics Facebook page. Next. In August last year, the only personal details that we got from the participants were their email addresses and ages. But now in the second page, we included the question asking for their city or province where they're located. In the table in the next slide, it will show you the questions that we asked. These are the same questions that we asked the participants for the first project phase. So in one word or phrase, how would you describe the current circumstances in which we find ourselves? What are the words or phrases you commonly hear, see, or use that can be associated with the pandemic? What are the emotions you associate with the pandemic? Are there words, phrases, your community, your barangay, municipality, city, province, region, specifically used in regard uh, that is not commonly mentioned in national media? And finally, among your social groups, what are the words or phrases you commonly use? Next. This time, there were, uh, there were 68 respondents compared to nine, 89 respondents, which we got from August last year. So these respondents came in from July 13 until just this week. And in terms of age, the top um, numbers are... 10 respondents who were aged 22, um, 7 respondents who were aged 25, 20 years old, and 23 years old with 6 respondents each. And uh, FYI, this is the very first time that we are showing and disseminating the results of this project, the second phase of this project. So now we go to the top 5 words and phrases associated with the pandemic. Next slide. So it might have come as a surprise that, um, can you show the next slide, please? Thank you. So it might have come as a surprise that um, when the Mentimeter participants were doing the, the thing, okay, uh, most of the people uh, did not expect perhaps that vaccine or bakuna would be the top response, at least with this batch of participants. So that's our limitation. We are just working with who answered our survey. So for 2021, the top five words that we have are vaccine or bakuna, quarantine, COVID, pandemic, and lockdown. Next. So vaccine or bakuna had 22 responses. Uh, for, for me and for the members of our team, it's quite unsurprising that you would actually expect this since 2021 saw the rapid development and distribution of vaccines from different manufacturers. So you also have associated terms with immunization like booster shot, second dose, comorbidity, side effects. It, ito yung mga salita na hindi naman natin naririnig outside of uh, medicine outside of the medical field, but now we see it all over uh, on mass media and social media, and we're more accustomed to hearing and reading it. There are also more colloquial synonyms like jab, which is actually uh, marked as British usage in online dictionaries. So even if it's from Britain, uh, we see this word, which means, which is a colloquial um, synonym for the actual vaccine shot. Uh, also, uh, quite widespread in newspapers and in other uh, avenues. So meron din tayong uh, verbal morphology, affixes that come with bakuna, di ba? Magpabakuna ka na. Uh, you can have, this is quite vague because you can have the meaning uh, bakunahan, which quite 
which adopts the more locative or the the place meaning or the occasion of getting the vaccines or pwede ring sabihin bakunahan di ba the um it's still to occur or it's still to happen that the action next slide please now let's go to quarantine. This was already part of our previous um, top five from last year. And we still documented the alternate spelling and translation na quarantina. Pero sa ngayon, sa um, results namin for this year, mas pronounced yung uh, various classifications which were imposed by the government and IATF. Yung ECQ, MECQ, MGCQ. And um, yung pinakahuli, I'd like to show, I'd like to emphasize that, may sumagot na walang katapusang CQ. Never-ending CQ. Next slide, please. Now, coronavirus or COVID-19 got 16 responses. Uh, more recent developments seem to be um, encoded in the responses here because you have words or phrases like COVID survivor, um, there are descriptive phrases which we are not sure. We are not. We are uncertain if this is a belief held by the respondent themselves, themselves, or by people around them. Na sa Cebuano ang sabi. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this correctly. Di man na tinuod ang COVID, buhat buhat raman na nila. So parang hindi naman daw totoo, di ba? Parang gawa gawa lang. Conspiracy theory, <laughs> ganon. The human-made virus. Uh, there are also puns, which will be elaborated more later on in the presentation. Miss Rona. Next, uh, pandemic. Pandemia, which, uh, which has 13 responses. Uh, there's a new blend which um, came into our um, survey results, pandemic cares. And pandemic can also be inflected with verbal affixes like na pandemic, eh, nagka pandemic eh. And you also have translations from other languages, such as Mandarin, as shown on the screen, because I cannot pronounce that. Next, lockdown, nine responses. You have neologisms, which is uh, one neologism which stood out is lock high. It, it's quite common in Philippine usage to, uh, to operate within these kinds of analogies. You have um, tuck in versus tuck out. <laughs> Shortcut versus long cut. So you have, instead of lockdown, lock high, a less strict lockdown, or a half-baked lockdown. So uh, the respondent said that this was encountered in Tacloban City. And you also have verbal morphology for this word, ma-lockdown or na-lockdown. Next. Okay, now I uh, turn over the mic to my colleague, Noah Cruz, for the top five emotions associated with the pandemic. Okay, for the third part of our survey, we asked the respondents about the emotions that they associate with the ongoing pandemic. With this question, we were able to elicit responses from English, Tagalog, and Waray. Similar to the results of our first survey, most of the responses that we have received are negative emotions. So next slide, please. The leading response to the uh, third question is anxiety. Anxiety, according to American Psychological Association, is an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, word thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure. One of the respondents particularly said that the anxiety that they experience stems from the fear of contracting COVID-19. Other terms related to anxiety given by the respondents include English term worry, Tagalog words kaba, pangamba, pag-aalala, and pranin. Some respondents also included the waray word kabaraka, meaning worry. Next slide, please. The word anger was input seven times for the survey question. According to American Psychological Association, anger is an emotion characterized by antagonism towards someone or something you feel has deliberately done wrong. Based on the explanation provided by some of the respondents, 
the anger that we are feeling is directed toward the government and its feeling response during this pandemic. Other responses that are related to anger are Tagalog words galit, ngalit, and ngit-ngit. Next slide, please. The feeling of frustration or being frustrated is the third leading response. Frustration, as defined by Geronimus and Lasul, is a key negative emotion that roots in disappointment and can be defined as irritable distress after a wish collided with an unyielding reality. One respondent elaborated their answer, stating that their frustration stems from the inadequacy of government response and the citizens' misinformation. The English word fear and the Tagalog word takot had six and five responses. One of the respondents specifically stated that during this pandemic, they fear for their food and job security. Uh, the Warai word karadlo was also given as a translation for the word fear. Next slide, please. Yeah. One of the very few positive uh, responses elicited in this survey question is the word hopeful. This response, re response reveals that despite the uncertainties brought about by the pandemic, there are still some people who believe that better deals will come. One particular respondent stated that they are looking forward to the Philippines reaching herd immunity. Okay, now let's move on to the next part of the survey. For the longest time, Filipino and English have been the primary languages of national media in the Philippines. Thus, terminologies from other languages of the country are not commonly mentioned in national news. For the fourth part of the survey, we ask our respondents to provide words and phrases that their communities specifically use in regard to the pandemic that are not commonly mentioned in national media. Next, please. First on the list is the word bangot. The word bangot is a Warai word, which means mask. To illustrate how the word bangot is used, here is an example sentence. Pagsulotin bangot kun makadto ka mercado. Wear a mask if you are going to the market. Interestingly, John Wolf was able to record the word bangot in his dictionary of Cebuano Visayan. According to Wolf, this word means to tie up someone or something's mouth or the lower part of the face. It is also used to refer to face coverings. Next. One of our respondents from Sagada Mountain Province listed the word suday. Suday is a kankanae term that refers to a ritual in Sagada wherein movement in or out of the village is restricted. It is practiced when there is a sickness afflicting a town. So they is described as the indigenous variation of black down. In other ethnolinguistic groups in Mountain Province, this practice is referred to as Tungaw, Tuer, Toor, Farae, Obaya, and Tungro. Next. The next word is Soob or Toob. So, most of us might have heard this term in national media. However, we included this on our list because different ethnolinguistic groups in the country have varying definitions for this term. So ob or to ob refers to the traditional practice of steam inhalation. Uh, it is practiced with salt or water infused with herbs. It is used as a remedy for diesel congestion, colds, and upper respiratory tract infections. Its process usually involves covering one's head to make sure that the steam does not escape during inhalation. Soob is widely known to be part of Cebuano traditional healing practices. However, many other areas in the country have been doing the practice in varying ways and contexts. For example, the Ati people of Panay describe Toob as a kind of ceremony practiced by the healers or medicine men to cure a sick child. In Marinduque, Soob is also a healing ritual. It involves the 
process of fumigation or burning of incense. Okay, the rest of the words on this list will be discussed by Mr. James Manley. Thank you. So in April of last year, the ILG issued a memorandum for LGUs to establish their own COVID-19 task forces and one mandate of which is to do contact tracing. This gave rise to local terms like Tai Tai Trail, QR codes used for contact tracing in Tai Tai Rizal, and Trace, the app used to scan QR codes in Taguig City. Next. Lastly, of course, we also have words which made a reappearance in this year's survey. We have Amping, the Cebuano word for Ingat, and various local terms for quarantine pass or travel pass, like the pink pass in Abra, and the S pass now used nationwide. Next. For social behaviors, let's hear it from Mount Divine. Hello, good afternoon. So I hope my internet works well. <laughs> if not, Vinci can take over my presentation. Okay. So social behavior with the, co the COVID-19 pandemic brought a lot of changes to how we conduct our lives due to the need for physical distancing, work, education, and social interaction mostly moved to the online sphere. Through technological innovations, we can communicate, hang out, play, work, and study despite the need for physical distancing. And this has actually caused an upsurge in the use of media devices, like in the Philippines and China, there was an increase of up to 86%. Online technology made it possible for us to engage with other people and to connect socially, albeit virtually. And then just imagine what we'd all be doing now if the internet is not as developed or as widely used and accessible as it is now. Although there's still issues, of course, because not everyone has the same ability or resources to access the internet. Okay, so we'll be looking at different aspects of our lives which have been affected by the pandemic, beginning with work. Uh, next slide, Jean. So in the next survey, in the previous survey, we were able to gather work from home, virtual online meeting, and vid call, uh, but we also lost our Zoom for this current survey, so it did not appear, the current survey. Next. Okay, so still, there's the prevalence of work from home set up and online meetings with these words, um, work from home, virtual online meeting, vid call or video call, and con call or conference call. And Zoom is still being the dominant platform. You have terms for Zoom meeting, Zoom training, or Zoom with us. But there's also the alternative, the Google Meet or G Meet. Okay. Um, next, there are also alternative work arrangements. Uh, while work from home is mostly the default for many, there are alternative work arrangements as well, especially during the times when the EZQ was lifted. For example, the bubble work arrangement wherein workers are split into groups and don't interact with other workers. So if one bubble gets infected, the group will be the only one in, uh, to quarantine. So hindi ma-apektohan yung iba. And it can also mean isolating a group of people in one place where they are not allowed to leave in order to conduct work. I think we're familiar with this use of basketball bubble. So you know, uh, to be able to play, they had to isolate themselves into bubbles. Next, um, work pass which is needed to be able to report to work physically in the office. There's also the distinction of being um, someone to work on site or in the office or whatever is the work site for that um, company and off site, which is for uh, those who are working from home. There's also the skeletal workforce, which uh, usually reduce on site workforce. And this might actually be a Filipinism because international English uses skeleton workforce and not skeletal. Then we have APOR, or authorized person outside the residence. Uh, this uh, just recently had been controversial because there are issues on who are allowed to transport the APOR to and uh, off for their um, works, workplaces. Okay, so that is for work. Meanwhile, for education, we were able to retain the terminologies webinar, online or virtual classes, and synchronous asynchronous. However, the word teacher broadcaster is not in the current data, while well, it was in the previous survey. Next. Okay, so what can we say about education? So it's all about online learning. So during the first run, we were not able to collect a lot of words related to education because at that point, 
uh, the pandemic was just uh, three months from March to August 2020. During that time, educational institutions were practically scrambling to come up with systems or methods on how to conduct classes. Um, by now, more than a year after the first ECQ, we have made progress, although there are still many pressing problems with regards to access, to quality, but still there is significant progress made. Okay, so learning is still done online through online or virtual classes um, held synchronously or asynchronously. There are webinars and there are also online palakayan or online discussions. Various approaches to teaching are flexible learning, blended learning, and distance learning. Okay, so in order to be able to teach online or distantly, we have to create learning materials. So these are self-learning modules, self-learning uh, guides. And uh, for those who do not have access to the internet, modules are delivered in person. Actually, my line pang sinabi na uh, mo deliver of module. I'll be delivering uh, modules. Next would be online discussions or preparations. These are for teachers and students where you have virtual discussions, um, learning action cell sessions, and online talakayan. Um, recording of lessons and also yung share screen. But there's uh, actually a joke about this na pwede bang mag-share ng screen na hindi mo sasabihin or without an announcing that you will share your screen. Um, next, certification and events. So we get our certificates as e-certificates now and not a physical paper. And also online graduation as virtual ceremonies. So at this point, uh, we have, we've had already two virtual graduation ceremonies for 2020 and 2021. Still with education, the platform. So while Zoom is the go-to platform for work and meetings for education, for the education sector and for students, uh, they use an alternative platform, especially for those features that are not available in Zoom. For example, yung Google Meet, Google Classroom, Google Forms for surveys, Google Docs, and um, checking attendance through Google as well. And we've also documented the problems encountered. So yung lag, di ba, sa internet. And there are these lines na, Oh, ma'am, we can hear you, or are you there? So it's like playing Atag Don, yung spirit of the glass. Are you there? Pakigalo na ba? So ako nandito ayo. Okay. Uh, next is um, with our social life and events. So there's still Inuman, online kumustahan, and quarant fling. But some words are not also in the current data, like Zoom party, Zoom game night, and EMAS. Okay, so how do people socialize? We, uh, we play games, but there are virtual games. So virtual game night, we have online games, and virtual reality or VR multiplayer games. We hang out via Inuman. This is actually the uh, the word with the... Okay, so it seems that uh, Divine has online the okay. or chikahan there's a kumustahan um star kantahan star kantahan would be um video okay and even if we are physically distanced from each other there's still space for love so there's love in the time of covid19 uh, there's internet or online love there's premium internet love zoom date or quarant fling so what do you think is the difference between love being just internet love or <laughs> it being premium, hindi ba? Kaya ang kaibahan nila. So, ang um, sabi, premium internet love is commonly seen on TikTok for couples who met online and are doing well. So they are in a committed relationship. So when it's just internet love, it can be a fling or, well, when you have apps, di ba? It's, it's free trial. But if premium... It means that the relationship is real, secure, and happy. Okay. Next, uh, Zoom date. So you just uh, face each other. I mean, get to know each other via Zoom. And quarantine fling also is a relationship um, which started in the pandemic, which may or may not end after this pandemic. Okay. Next would be uh, how to commemorate events. So sadly, yung funerals ay ano na lang, online, ilibing. And some prayer meetings, yung tinatawag nilang online dampana, ay online prayer meetings na lang din. 
common platforms for socializing would be Netflix. You can have a Netflix party or a teleparty. There, there's TikTok, there, there's Discord, Zoom, and the various ways Zoom is used. The use of Kumo for Kumustahan and the use of Star Maker for Star Kantahan yeah, um, video key session. Next for shopping, obviously, and then parin ang Lazada and Shopee. There's still Plantita and Plantita. But for now, there's uh, no ally, add to cart, online palenque, and pasabay in the current data. So for shopping, platforms are still Lazada and Shopee. So actually, Lazada reported a 250% increase in daily sales, while Shopee sold 200 million items in 24 hours during their 11-11 sale. Uh, in 2019, 70 million lang yon. So ayun, abang-abang. Ng ano, di ba? Malapit na ang nine nine. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the shift towards a more digital world, and the changes we make now will have lasting effects as the world economy begins to recover based on the UN trade report. Uh, aside from Lazada and Shopee, there's also Grab, Grab Delivery, and yung paayuda, where you ask deliveries from friends, or they deliver to you without asking. Some products that are, ay dito, nauso. Sa panahon na to would be the sushi bake, pandikoko, yung pagiging plantito and plantita, having DIY or do-it-yourself projects na uso sa isang Facebook group called the Homebodies, and yung budol. Budol is to be easily influenced into buying a product. So malapit na ang diba, September 9, 9, 9, so ano naman yung mga budol finds din nyo. Okay? This pandemic also saw the rise of online selling, online businesses, and Online businesses also have their own vocabulary, tulad ng pamine or miner. And then, uh, to avail the services of these online businesses, you have to use e-finance platforms like online banking, e-wallet, and Gcash. Next is vaccination. This is actually a new category. We didn't have this uh, in the previous na survey, which is also evidence of yung tao dito, yung kay Vinci kanina na vaccine yung first na word. So this is a new category. It can also be bakuna or bakunahan. You have um, records, the dosage or records. You'll have your first dose, second dose, yung jab, vaccination card, or being fully vaccinated. There's also behavior where um, what we try to achieve is herd immunity. There are people with vaccine hesitancy, and there are people who are downright anti-vaxxers. So, anti-vaccination sila. Um, then, the brands that are prominent are Sinovac, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and Moderna. There's actually a meme going around, di ba? Na kapag ang bakuna mo ay Pfizer or Moderna, i-announce mo siya talaga sa social networking sites. Tapos kapag sinovac naman yung vaccine mo, ang status mo ay the best vaccine is the vaccine in your arm. Tapos kapag Astra naman, hindi ka pa makapag-post online kasi nilalagnat ka pa. Okay. Next is um, fashion. There's even fashion. You have a bakuna blouse and various expressions like vaxxed ka na, anong brand ng bakuna mo, uh, ayun, magpabakuna ka na, and the best vaccine is the vaccine in your arm. Next, uh, messages. Next, Nachin. Next, yeah, messages. So common sentiments expressed in messages to social groups are still about concern and caution. Yung lagging mag-ingat, mag ng mask, and stay at home, follow the protocols. Yung condolence actually is new. We only have this in the current survey, and this is quite sad. Na I'm sure many of you or some of you have experienced this na your Facebook page or any of your social networking sites ay para na siyang nagiging obituary, di ba? So maraming mga ano, maraming, you have lost uh, people due to this pandemic. Then there's well wishes and encouragement. Yung uh, miss you, always pray, um, kapit lang makaya nato ni. Uh, it means kapit lang kaya natin to. Or dilit na mag-give up or we don't give up. And of course, there's still hope, looking forward to things getting better. Uh, mes messages like, see you soon, when this virus ends, when it's safe to travel, etc. Uh, uh, let's eat para after this pandemic. 
So that is how our social behavior was affected by this pandemic. And now we go to the neologisms and to James. Thank you. So as we will see, there are um, there are many words relating or referring to the pandemic that pops up almost every day. So next slide, please. Robert Lawson cites that linguistic change, especially uh, neologisms, is a product of large social changes or social crisis. In the time of COVID-19 pandemic, this is attributed to, first, the spread of the virus and its dominance in the media, and second, the rise of global interconnectivity through the internet. Coining these neologisms, or in our case, coroneologisms, gives labels to our experiences and enables us to refer to refer to and talk about them, often in a cheerful spirit and as a coping mechanism. So what are the words we've seen and heard in the past six months? Next. So first for coronavirus. So present in last year's survey are Rona, Miss Rona, Big Rona, and the Rona, so various clips of coronavirus, and Miss Universe, referring to the expression, wag mo munang iuwi ang corona. Next. So what are... The new, the new words we've seen in this year's survey are 2019 BC, so originally before Christ. BC can now refer to the time before COVID-19 pandemic, before Corona. So other related terms include pre-pandemic era and hashtag panahon bago ang sakuna. Also, we have Dili Bayaran, euphemism referring to Delta variant used in Negros Occidental. Next. For COVID, um, present in the last year's survey are covid cation and covid dub dub And next, the, um, the word covid yot from COVID and idiot are present in both surveys. Next. But the words COVID fatigue, corn beep, and panini are present in this year's survey. They're new. So for COVID fatigue, also pandemic fatigue, uh, feeling demotivated and tired of the pandemic following and following protocols to protect ourselves from the virus. Corn beef from corn beef, uh, euphemism for COVID, and panini or panini press, uh, global Pandora, pandesal, so various uh, euphemisms for pandemic used to circumvent the monetization of YouTube videos mentor mentioning the coronavirus pandemic. Next, for Zoom, the old words we had are Zoom B, Zoom Genic, and Fast Talk. Next. So present in both, both surveys are Zumba, Zoom bombing, Zoom mustahan, and Zoom fatigue. And the new words that we've seen are Zoom fee from Zoom and selfie, or using Zoom to take selfies uh, through screen capture or from your phone, right? And to Zoom, so using Zoom as a verb, meaning to participate in a Zoom call. So meaning um, let's Zoom, wanna Zoom, or Zoom them. Next, for quarantine, uh, the old words we had are quarantine, quarantines, quarantines, next, uh, quarantine investment, and quirth day. Next, so as mentioned, quarant fling and quarant thing, it's still a thing. So love during the pandemic. And the new words we've seen are quarant bills, so bills due during the pandemic, quarant look, or new normal fashion, or OOTD, or color coordinated face, so color-coordinated face masks, or wearing formal tops like polos tas nakapajama pants during work from home. Quarant think or quarant talk, so think pieces or talk shows during produced during the pandemic. Next, we also have NCR Plus, so the bubble composed of Metro Manila, Bulacan, Rizal, Laguna, and Cavite. So it's also used humorously as it is likened to constantly changing phone models like uh, NCR Plus Ultra or NCR Pro Max and the like. Tiny bubbles. The individual bubbles of each NCR city during the recent ACQ, MECQ. So at the risk of dating ourselves, this term birthed various memes referring to Nor on Nor song, Tiny Bubbles. Next, vaccine. So this is a new theme since, yeah, as mentioned, the news regarding COVID vaccines only entered the mass media at the latter part of 2020. So as mentioned in the comments I've seen kanina, res bakuna from res bak and bakuna used by DOH and their vaccination campaigns. So other slogans they use also are bida solution, so another wordplay, and bida bakonation. Good job. 
often used by commercial establishments to give discounts to vaccinated people so to to incentivize people to get the vaccine natusok used to mean nabakunahan or naturukan next kickback used to refer to alleged misappropriation of vaccine doses and or the money allotted for the procurement thereof and sinuga a uh, euphemism for Sinovac vaccine used in Surigao. Next, we have various clips, initialisms, and compound words as well. So old, um, old clips, uh, initialisms, we've seen are HB for heart back, OLB for online birthday, and VC and VM for video call and video message, PANDE for pandemic or pandemia, and kapit buhay, a word play on kapit bahay. Andiyan din yung um, hindi mamatay-matay na naol ay, or from sana all. And another related expression is when kaya. So these are expressions wishing for other success or luck to spread to ourselves as well. And yung mga bago, the new words we've seen are G and LDR. So G, used when accepting invites like gifts or calls. And LDR, long distance relationship. So these two are actually old terms, but their use became more widespread this year. Um, before its use was limited to younger generations. But now older people we see are starting to use them as well. Other words, um, lastly, are mask me. So mask and acne. Um, acne breakouts used by wearing fa- caused by wearing face mask um, for a long period of time. Kupitan, referring to barangay opi- officials who mismanage ayuda or SAP funds. And various word plays on ayuda like bulsa ayuda, barya ayuda, and delta ayuda. Okay, so in summary, the observations from this current set of data, first one would be the appearance of the top word vaccine or bakuna is quite expected given the salience of these events and developments. And the same can also be said for the other four words and variations thereof. Negative emotions are still dominant with the addition of boredom. Many respondents point out that these emotions are directed and directed to and caused by the government. Third one, for words not commonly used in national media, we can see the adaptation of traditional practices like suob and sudai in response to the needs of the current times. For social behavior, there's uh, for work, there's the availability, availability of alternative work arrangements. In education, there are more preparations as opposed to the previous year and the inclusion of vaccine and its related terms in normal everyday repertoire. And the fifth one is that the emergence of pandemic-related euphemisms show how coinage of neologisms help us name and cope with our new realities. So this project, the LexiCovid project, aimed to capture a part of the linguistic creativity we as Filipinos exhibited during the pandemic. It's about what we experienced, what we felt, how we adopted and adjusted our lives, and how we've used our linguistic creativity and humor to coin words to describe this reality. At any time, language helps us understand what is happening around us, and at the same time, help us cope with events. The survey gives us a glimpse into how language can quickly change in the face of unprecedented social and economic disruption. Language is always in flux, and it is always in keeping with reality and what is happening with the world. Language acts like um, living entities and evolve over time, adapting to new realities and circumstances. And this is why social change can bring linguistic change. So from this survey, what emerged uh, is a record of our lives in lockdown, describing our collective experience and sense making. So that is it for uh the lexicovid projects if you have any questions kindly uh, write them down in the comments and we will answer them later in the question and answer session okay so now we go to our third speaker i will be introducing our third speaker see okay so our third speaker is samantha sadural who is also known as samantha she has been consistently active in the development of TOSD-funded UP Diliman research projects since 2012. 
a former employee of Google Ventures, she started off as a speech specialist for said projects, eventually being a content manager in 2013. And in 2017, she became the project manager for Talkie Talk, a learning English application that can be downloaded from the Google Play Store. So please download that in the Google Play. Currently, she is the project manager of Project Marium, which is an online dictionary maker for Philippine languages, and Handoom as well as a graduate student of the Department of Linguistics in UP Diliman. Okay. So shall we play the Mintimeter again? <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you very much for that introduction. So I did uh, earlier, some people has already answered, what is your native language? And you would see that Tagalog, Filipino, Bisaya, Ilocano. So one or is still the ones that uh, seems to be the one dominating this this slide. We still have Rinconada, Waray, Bicol Albay. For the person who was busy, thank you. We're also busy. We feel you. Hiligaynon, <laughs> Magayon. So these are, are the native languages of our viewers for today. And before I do continue with my talk, we've come from the past with Miss Honeylet's talk and the present with the pandemic talk of the Lexicovid. Let's have one more question for everyone who's in. Please do get in. Uh, you can go to mentimeter.com and use the code 12053790. Uh, the department would link the ones, uh, would link the, the code in the comments so please do get in here and let's have that question to answer fast to get more points what do you think does mario mean some people would actually know what this mean but does it mean deep does it mean wise or does it mean words time's up and goes to show that we have a lot of uh, speakers here. As his speakers, it does mean deep. And with that, I would like to introduce my, on behalf of my awesome team, I would like to introduce Project Marayom. And just a, a bit of a backgrounder. There are 186 languages in the Philippines, 34 are in trouble. 11 are dying and 2 are extinct. This is from the Ethnologue of the Philippines Retrieved Justice, June 2021. Communities can be empowered if we give them the tools and researches, resources to conduct research. Uh, Ms. Hanulet did mention that earlier that uh, it's best that we give these tools so that our communities can be empowered and can learn to take care of their own languages. And this is where Project Mariam comes in. So what is Mariam? Mariam is funded by DOST Philippines and developed by the University of the Philippines, Diliman. We provide an online dictionary tool for the language community to create, upload, and maintain their own language dictionary even without technical knowledge in the lexicographic and information technology fields. What does this mean? I'll, um, I'll talk more about this. But why a dictionary? Dictionaries is, serves as a documentation of language use and a study guide, and it can help transmit and preserve a language for future generations. Not only does dictionary become a record of the language at this point in time, it can also be a reference for students who are studying not just their language, but also other languages. Uh, it is also partly inspired because of the mother tongue-based multilingual educations. These are we have 19, I believe, 19 languages used out of 186 languages. Only 19 languages are officially used in kindergarten and grades 1 to 3. And it's great DepEd, the Department of Education, is open to dialogue for inclusion of additional languages. And to be included in MTPMLE, you need to have your own dictionary, your own language dictionary. At the, at the same time, however, to create a dictionary, you need a corpus. How, 
and from experience from Ma'am Shirley Dita of La Salle, of Rojas, and Inventado in 2009, corpus creation as a tool for dictionary building is difficult to apply to low-resource Philippine-type languages. Low-resource means that we don't have enough written works in our languages, and that's how you create your corpus. Written works, spoken words, videos, media, we do not have a lot of these resources for other Philippine languages. To overcome the lack of corpora, Marayum used practical lexicographic approach integrated with documentary lexicographic approaches with community-based research methods to engage the language communities. Let's go through it one by one. Um, community-based participatory research, or ACTS, means to engage a community to participate in every aspect of the research process. So it's not as if the community the, the team just went to the community and presented it as a whole. We developed the tool in such a way that the community is developing it alongside us so that we could produce results and output this relevant to their circumstances. And we have gone through this a while ago, but I'll just repeat it. Lexicography is an activity that consists of observing, collecting, selecting, analyzing, and describing lexical items belonging to one or more dictionaries. And in creating a dictionary, you have a lexicography. Uh, we, we chose to employ documentary lexicography, which is a type of elicitation process that identifies lexical items by semantic fields through a word list. So for Marayum, we chose the word list that our department uses, which is the 505 words. Uh, hello? I, I hope I'm being heard. Okay. So in documentary lexicography, since we don't have a corpus, we opted to go for what the, the 505 words that allows for Marayum to gather the scope even though not the depth, but at least a wide scope of the language and its culture. So by experience, I've been to um, Cordillera languages, and they don't have a lot of words for, say, um, the sea, the lampasigan. Uh, it's mostly katabi ng dagat. They don't have as much words as compared to when you go to Visayan languages and Cebuano, and they'll have a lot of words for the sea, a lot of words even in Bituan when we ask, what what do you call, uh, how would you translate the word fish? And they're like, what type of fish? <laughs> this size, this big size. So the, the depth and the scope of the language can be covered by this 505 words. Practical lexicographic approach, and I, I won't discuss this as much as in depth, even though this is a lexicographic talk, because it does get nitty gritty and it gets into the theory. I try to explain it one by one, but the practical lexicographic approach have six phases that we implemented in Marayom system architecture. So later, I'll, I'll be discussing this in terms of how we prepared and planned the dictionary with the community, how we collected the material and processed it, as well as evaluate it so that it'll be ready for publication, uh, in the preparation for the publication and the publication itself. And the result is, Marium is now available at marium.ph, but Please do listen to me first <laughs> before we, you visit our website. Uh, when we launched way back in March this year, not way back, but just March of this year, we had four initial dictionary offerings, which is the ASI English, Hilagay non English, Sabuano English, and Kinaira English. But as of today, additional dictionaries are being made at the back end of Marayon with Akianon Bicol Boynen or Buhinon, Buhinon, I'm sorry if, if pronounced that wrong, Bicol Central, Bicol Rinconada, Blend Sarangani, thank you Fulong Romi for communicating with us, Blend Coronadal, Gadang, Ilocano, Itawis, Ivatan, Kapampangan, Maspateño, and Waray. 
And part of the reason why we're having this talk and I'm doing this talk on behalf of my team is so that we'll have more languages who would use Marayum and so that the language community will be the one to create their dictionaries. So this is what Marayum looks like. If we go to the website, you have this London page. This is the home page and we have a lot of, we tried to include as many words as says thank you. The dictionary screen showing the word list and the word details. So we have the full list. The full list um, corresponds to the A to Z index. This is part of the preparation aspect or the planning aspect. And we took advantage of the wide scope of the unlimited space that the internet have. So the core words list is the onomonosh onomachological list wherein you'd have the 505 words and additional words group into the cultural um, cultural categories that they have. So you have material words, the body, cosmology, etc. You also have the verbs there uh, listed with the other verbs in the um, in the list in the dictionary. So it also widens up a bit. So you'd have oh, I, I went ahead and said about the core word leads. And the 505 words would be your seed dictionary. This is the dictionary screen growing more information. And you would notice that we have the Lima, the, um, the International Phonetic Alphabet on how to pronounce the word. We are uh, following the categoriality of words in the Philippines, in the Philippine type languages, we opted that the definition is connected to the part of speech. And then we only added the affixes right after. So you would notice that there is no um, actor focus or the focus system here, but we plan to add it in the second phase of the project. So for now, we had the, the affixes. Internally, we fix it the way that actor focused, object focused, etc. So it is an online dictionary tool. And at the end of the day, Marayum is a research project and an academic project. So the revision system dashboard, this back end or the revision system that edits the dictionary itself is exclusive only to the members of the language community. So let's click the front matter. The front matter would have the additional articles regarding the language. So you have the grammar essentials in here and I am do I am calling for help for the linguist in the department and other um, other schools, other communities to fill up this space so that we'll be able to add more into the uh, into Marayum. Uh, the member list is again the revision system there's a member button here wherein the editor of the dictionary can um, accept applicants of the language community so the details that we asked would be the email the birth the birth the birthplace, other languages spoken because we wanted to gather as much information and we would rather that the native speaker of the language would be the one contributing to the language dictionary as well as affiliations and other dictionary groups. If you click an entry, you'd see uh, before I discuss further, when you click an entry, there are three stages of revision and three types of roles in Marayom, you have the contributor. The contributor can suggest edits and submit revisions for review. They can also add additional words. The contributor is and should be the native speaker of that language dictionary, of that language for the language dictionary. The reviewer would review whatever the contributor has um, submitted and ideally, ideally, it's still the native speaker of that language dictionary, but it can also be a linguist or a linguistic student or any language um, language related researcher that is concentrated on that language. 
and the editor. The editor ideally would be the linguist specializing in that language. So in in linguistics, in our department, there's always this dream of one language, one linguist. And hopefully, Marayom is a tool that could help material, materialize that dream. So for every round of submissions, the reviewer reviews it for, um, for approval, just to check whether or not it's the right verb, or if you have other definitions for this word, if you could gather certain information from this. So this can also be an elicitation tool for the review for the reviewer or the researcher. And the editor would be the one who approves uh, a word to be for it to be published online. So it has these stages and a word can, you could see how the word was edited, added from etymology. Uh, certain words, you could also see some change logs on the left if it's for reconsideration, if there is some small edits needed, and if it's for review. So this is what a word entry looks like. You have the word pronunciation. For now, we do ask for um, submissions on the recording, even though it's not yet being played on the live site or on the dictionary itself. A variant of the language. So we do have variants of the language. For now, the Cebuano dictionary that we have on Marium is a Southern Later variant. Thank you for Divine for being our editor for that derivations, etymology, and related words. The definition, as I mentioned, is connected to the part of speech. And we do ask before it gets published that there's a sample sentence and a translated sentence for this. Um, I also would want to uh, rec I, I would want to recall back to Ms. Hannah Let's Talk wherein she discussed that ideally the L2 or the definition should be in Tagalog or another, or it'll be monolingual. And that's the dream. But for now, since we have English as our second language and we do not want to get all political about this, we opted that English would be the second language for the definition for now. And we'll ready the system for monolingual dictionaries in the future. So this is what it would look like. And this is one of the things that we're really proud of in Marayom. We made sure that every contributor, reviewer, and editor would be credited per word. This is so that we could give the community that level of um, ownership to their language because it is their language. Did I mention that Marayom is free? <laughs> we're keeping it free since this is a research project. And hopefully that communities would get involved and be able to be proud that they'll, when they see their name that they contributed to the dictionary and they'll be more motivated to add more and more words into it. So if you're applying for a new dictionary, uh, aside from the words that's not there, please do email us at kumusta.marayom at gmail.com. Or if you're applying as a contributor, reviewer, or editor of an existing dictionary, you can always go to marayom.ph slash apply. So this is really a short introduction to Marayom, and hopefully I'll see you for the orientation for the editors, contributors, and reviewers soon. Maraming salamat po, and I'd really want to call. Uh, I would really want to thank, take this opportunity to thank my team, the T4 team for developing the website for me, for the linguists that are involved in this, for UP, for trusting us with the project, DOST and DOST Pressured for uh, developing, for funding the project, ASCA, ASCA or the ASI Studies Center for Culture and the Arts are the ones who will say the community that developed Marayom alongside us. They're the ones who who really stepped up and and pushed us to to develop something this big. SIL for guiding us because they have the immense experience in dealing with Philippine languages for the Department of Computer Science and the Department of Linguistics who will be the ones to handle Marayom from this point on. So thank you very much. Maraming maraming salamat po.
at mabuhay ang mga wika ng Pilipinas. We are now opening the floor for questions. And let me call back the speakers of um, the talks today. Uh, Hanulet, Minchi, Divine, James, Noah. Uh, can we address the challenges brought about by the dynamism of language? So who would want to uh, share their opinions, opinion about this first? Vinci, <laughs> what do you say about this in relation to lexicography? Okay. Um, the dynamism of language is, uh, um, I've answered this somewhere else, <laughs> it's a natural <laughs> process. And it is uh, part and uh, it's really integrated in the system of language and pretty much um, all human phenomenon, phenomena. So the challenges that it brings might be uh, more accurately framed as challenges perhaps of comprehension, of understanding in between speakers of different languages and varieties. In relation to lexicography, perhaps I'd like to zoom in more on the LexiCovid project. Um, we, we're seeing this really uh, rapid dynamism, changes, uh, real time no mga wika na sinasalita natin at yung mga salita na ginagamit natin. And so um, what what the project aims to do is for these findings and these um, these this data that we have gathered, sorry, yung aso namin baka naririnig. Uh, the data that we have gathered to help us in crafting more inclusive and effective communicative Communication, uh, communication strategies as we move forward because we are still in the pandemic and um, surely this is not going to be the last uh, sort of up upheaval such as this. I mm -hmm. think that's all I have to say regarding that question. And I would like to add on that, especially on the lexicographic side. Uh, if one of the things that we really do consider, what are the words that we should add on the dictionary? So we're, because we don't have a corpus yet for Philippine type languages, and we're opting to develop that uh, with the use of Marayom eventually, we, we will have to consider first, because there are in the 100% of languages, we have 10% 10, 10 only of the words that are used daily. So you have the um, particles, you have the verbs, and you have 90% that are not used that much. So say the word pumapag-ibig, do we still use that? Jologs. We use those terms that are they fit to be in the dictionary? That explains the dynamism of our language at this point, and it's something that should be celebrated. So. Um, in lexicography, we have these slang words or present words to catch the snapshot of that language. And ideally, first, we concentrate on the words that we use in day to day so that we'll be able to um, use it academically. But let's still write that. Uh, even though we still don't have Pumapag Ibig, we still understand what that means. And Lexicovid is such a great project because it captures the pandemic language that we have right now and hopefully in the future we won't be able to use these terms because we're out of COVID. <laughs> yes and yeah so that's I think that's what I have for that. Uh, Divine do you want to answer this one given our linguistic differences? Oh, Are the rest vacuna and be the public health campaigns that effective? Oh, okay. So I'm not in healthcare, <laughs> so <laughs> I can't really answer it um, quantitatively in those terms. But um, sorry, the question is lost. <laughs> is it really effective? I guess in a way it can because it is from a language that somewhat all of us understands. But I mean, it's in Filipino, so it's um, widespread, it's used in the mass media, and being used in mass media is one of the 
easiest or the greatest ways in order to be able to spread um, yung usage of a word. So, well, they're still using it. So I hope they are testing whether their campaigns are really effective or not. But on our end, as we don't have, we actually don't have data to be able to test this. So, yeah. But um, I think if you remember, uh, one of the earliest na mga um, efforts of the department uh, during the pandemic was the translation of materials yes. into into regional languages and i think that kind of help has uh, has been a, invaluable in this entire experience i think that question was asking um uh, more about inclusion what about our languages what about our framing um of this experience so um if we are if we are able to continue doing uh, we are yeah if we can continue do uh, doing that um that would really help a lot Mm -hmm. That was actually the point why we asked for terms that are not commonly heard in national media, as it could be possible that there are terminologies that already exist in one of our native languages that could more adequately describe what it is, that what the situation is, or what we are undergoing now, or what can we do, about what can be the possible solutions. Right, and the response yeah. of, the, of the people, the response from yes. the ground. People yes. contributing on the on that effort has been really inspiring. Yes. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the ways that um, translation seems to help in in understanding our current situation is the usage of Luyong before, mm -hmm. and so uh, instead we don't really have a mass media term for storm surge, but they did look and search that found that there's a Luyong term, and so it's easier even. Uh, it's easier for us to understand. So I do. Uh, I guess one of the things that we need to concentrate on this question is really on the effectivity of language in terms of uh, government-wide <laughs> responses and terms being used. ECQ, MCQ, GCQ, bakuna, <laughs> and dami. Eh. So all these terms, I believe, because we're not really looking on from the ground it's hard to relate but to measure the effectiveness we, we cannot answer that at this point <laughs> definitely we do need to reach out to regional sectors of our of our country so that we'll be able to relate to them more at the end of the day language is about communicating and if we can't relate we cannot communicate we cannot understand what's important so Mr. Carlo, Carlo Galicia mentioned that I think language is an important consideration in considering vaccination effort. That's true. It's very true. Sometimes when vaccinated people are told they are protected, they implicitly assume they're not going to get sick. Yes. So health workers need to be clear about this to reduce risky behavior after vaccination, such as going out even when not needed or abandoning health protocols. So the, the effort of the department on the, not just like COVID, but the translation really did help on, on this. And I hope that it continues moving forward. So uh, as linguists, I believe in this group, please do help us reach out <laughs> to this, to our community. So that will be able to help them then in communicating properly. Uh, Mr. Garcia Pertiguera, I hope I pronounced that right. For LexiCovid, what method did you use? Instrument slash others. <laughs> Difficulties and our positives in the experience. Thanks. So I believe that uh, Noah, would you like to take this? Uh, hello. Ayun. Uh, related rin to the sub question, sir. The professor Laran. Uh, for the LexiCovid project, um, uh, instrument ay yung online survey. So dahil nga sa limitasyon ng pandemia, hindi kami nakapag face-to-face na survey at interview. So yung pagkolekta lang namin ay uh, ginawa namin sa pamamagitan ng survey. So usapin naman ng limitasyon, uh, maraming limitasyon at isa sa nakikita kong limitasyon doon ay uh, hindi uh, walang refleksyon noong um, karanasan o yung paggamit ng gika ng mga nasa informal sector. Kasi kung susuriin natin yung datos na nakuha namin, parang karamihan ay may kinalaman sa uh, online uh, uh, work from home setup, 
uh, online schooling, tapos uh, shopping. So, hindi namin uh, nakita doon sa datos na nakalap namin kung ano yung pagbabago doon sa wika o doon sa mga salita ang ginagamit ng mga uh, mamamayang gaya ng mga nakikinta, yung mga magsasaka, o yung mga hindi nare-reach nung uh, survey namin. Thank you for that. Uh, to add yes, to that, yeah, it's mm-hmm. really, if you see the demographic, it's really young. Diba? So, yes. nasa 20s na ganyan. So, we're not able to reach out uh, more people in terms of this. So, yun nga, wala kaming records of people who have no internet access. And we know that that is really very much a problem when it comes to work. And even sa education, diba? sobrang malaking problema. Ayun. Okay. So, Ma'am Manta, can we use Marayom? Yes, please. <laughs> please do use Marayom. Um, not just as a similar concept, but please do use Marayom. <laughs> this contact us at kumusta, kumusta.marayom at gmail.com. Uh, please do add on to it na instead of creating a new one. I won't stop you if you want to create a new one. <laughs> but since it's already here, I hope that you use it na lang. So... Uh, okay, given that everyone from the community can participate in contributing and editing the lexicons, how can the team of Marayum ensure that words put in the website are standard or any words contributed are welcome? Okay, there are two questions in this. Number one, yes, any words contributed are welcomed. Why? Because we do not have data. <laughs> we cannot standardize anything that we do not have data and substantial amount of data on. And um, what, that's why we put into place the rules of contributors, editors, and reviewers so that we'll be able to at least make sure that the words in Marayum are academic. I am not sure about standardization, and I will not answer that uh, because I believe that the educational sector will be the best to answer something like this. As linguists, we aim to describe and record the language, and that is what's most important at this point that we have dying languages that we have uh languages that are we're not sure if they're still being used talaga and even in research it's really hard to uh capture that so standardization is way up there <laughs> yeah language researchers especially translators are largely Descriptivist, are there instances when you have taken the normativist approach? Uh, normativist, uh, prescriptivist uh, approach in, yeah, somewhat. Nilet, do you have any opinion on this? Um, well, if, if um, the question is about fidelity to the material, if the question is about fidelity to the material, how, how faithful we are that we are translating effectively, not correctly or appropriately, but effectively. I think um, one um, overarching principle in translation is um, uh, the, uh, the translation for equivalent effect. And if you are guided by that um, principle, um, you make sure that your translation does not only sound natural, but it sounds, uh, but but that it achieves the same effect uh, in the source language or in the original one uh, as it is supposed to achieve in the translated na language. So if we are guided by that principle, then um, that's the way to go. <laughs> Minchi, do you want to end on that? Okay. Um, when it comes to dictionary making, lexicography. Uh, of course, we will have to um, we will have to adopt a, a more or less regular orthography and a representation for the lima for the limata for the words that we are going to uh, put in the dictionary. Now, um, in order for us to adopt that uh, a, an orthography with a semblance of consistency. Diba? Consistency. Uh, yeah. of, of course, there will be, yes, some level of um, prescription involved. And that's really normal. Um, there are really no hard binaries to these concepts. Uh, 
yes, we do describe. We do describe languages in their natural usage and context. That is true. That still holds true. But um, there are times and contexts when we call for also uh, more norm normative and actually um, prescribe to a certain extent. We like that phrase, di ba? Sa mm -hmm. social sciences, to a certain extent. To a certain extent, definitely. Yes. I would like to... Uh pinpoint an example for kakalabas, kalalabas, kakakain, ay, huwag yun. <laughs> Kabababa, kakababa, ayan. So, madami yan. Yung kaka na yan. If we're following the prescriptive or normativist mindset, you do not say kakalabas. Kakalabas ko lang. You say kalalabas ko lang. But as descriptivist in in linguistics, we have to take note of that as a variant. Then we put kalalabas as what's normal, hopefully. But once the corpus comes in, that's when we can only pinpoint what's normal, what's standard, and what's not. So I guess it's the best way to answer that. Okay, so uh, before I do close the panel, I, I do would like to ask for opinions of the speakers here on what do you think about the current situation of the Philippine lexicography as we have right now? So we're, yeah, <laughs> we're all trying. But would, do you have anything to say about that? James? Yeah, and so first, um, it, it's I, I was reading through the comments while uh, we are presenting and I I am very happy to see na maraming interested about lexicography because you know um people they say uh, dictionary very boring why would you read that but lexicography as what we are uh, so what we're trying to um uh, synthesize here is an important way to get screen, uh, snapshots of our um, of our daily life. As we go on, because you know, language is dynamic. So, as as fast as it changes, our efforts to do lexicography to work on our dictionaries is very very important. And I hope that through our lectures, and we see um, how lexicography developed through the ages, um, a, an informal way of doing lexicography, like the lexicovid, uh, and the challenges online um, word gathering. Um, entails and yun yung more um, more formal I guess of making dictionaries like the Marayum project so ayan okay thank you James um, any other questions for <laughs> the various forms of community quarantines came up in the lexicovid project is there a disjunct in the meaning of the said types of CQ based on their technical definition given by the government? And how they are being used on the ground in different places? If there is a disjunct, how can we improve public communication of these policies? Lexicovid speakers? <laughs> Divide? Uh, this... Actually, not in my data. It's <laughs> like Vinci. But anyway, um, I have not. The respondents only gave yung uh dito, yung acronyms, but they did not really give a definition, their own definitions of how mm -hmm. they interpret this community quarantine. I actually have one student who is doing this now, but I don't have her paper yet. So she's studying how. Mm, ayun government directives and how people interpret it. Kasi ang dami, di ba? Pero we're not really sure how to act on it. So there's always the disjunction. Well, there's always a disjunction of um, what the government wants us to do and how we do things because they're not, they don't communicate it well. And at the same time, sa totoo lang, sila mismo ay magulo <laughs> with regards to their guidelines. So, how to improve public communication? It would come from them first. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, eh, yun. 
Thank you. Thank you, Divine, for that. And thank you, Diane, for that question. Yeah. Vinci, do you want to add on that? Uh, yung masasabi ko naman dyan ay it's, uh, it's, it has always been repeated in conferences such as these that that could be the subject of further research. So, yes. uh, I will I will pull that um, further research card at, at this moment. <laughs> yes. And I, yeah. I guess at, at the end um, of the day, it's a communication thing. No? It's crisis communication that we'll have a panel on tomorrow, the last panel for tomorrow on disaster crisis communication and linguistics. Yes, Divine, do you want to add on to that? Oh, I just want to comment that. But if you don't know, they might have the answer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I and, think um, also, if, wait, no, if this gets available, uh, uh, you can check the Suri Centro ng Wikang Filipino. They held a discussion on this about disaster uh, crisis communication also. Please check their Facebook page if they have made this uh, the video available. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, before we finally end the panel, <laughs> we would like to show who won. Who won? <laughs> in, our, in our activity. Yan na. Natalo ba si Rhea Agibuay? Ha! The dance of Belize. <laughs> Yay! Oh, <laughs> Thank you for seeing Chua. Please, what are they please do send that uh, screenshot that it's your name and to message us on Facebook so that we could give you your prize. Bragging rights. <laughs> bragging rights. Just bragging rights for now, but with prize. <laughs> Papa alam po namin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So, final round of comments. Suggestions, violent reactions. <laughs> so if you do have comments, suggestions, and violent reactions on our topics, and if you have additional research topics, if you want to use Merayo, please do go to like click click like and subscribe. Wow. <laughs> for for the UP linguistics uh, Facebook page and um, YouTube page and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>